Lauren Stanford is a busy 13 year old. Do you think this one is actually like swimming? We won the soccer championships. That one? I think I got her high honors. Oh. And she's got another major project keeping herself alive. At 7.15, I checked my blood. At 9.30, I checked my blood. 186. At 12.11, I checked my blood. Hold that up. At 3 or 2.45, I checked my blood. At 6 o'clock, I checked my blood. So this is it, huh? Yeah. Lauren has type 1 or juvenile diabetes. Oh, you're hiding. She's had it since she was in oh, kindergarten. Yeah, on the top. Oh, yeah, there you are. Yeah. Cup to the Unlike some kinds of diabetes, type 1 requires constant vigilance. Whoa, too much. Counting carbs, checking blood sugar, and adjusting her insulin pump. Make sure it's a good spot that doesn't have any scar. What would you say is the toughest thing about having this disease in, in, in your family? It's just invaded every corner of every member of our family. And everything that we're doing and she's doing is simply just keeping her alive. Oh, wow. So how does this work? What, what does this do for you? Um, it gives me insulin. It's giving me insulin all around. Like every 10 seconds, I get insulin. And then Even with all her high-tech gadgets, Lauren cannot control her blood sugar, as well as a working pancreas. Up into your arm, and there's a needle that actually goes into your yeah, arm. Yeah, but then you take it out, and it's just After like 15 or 20 years with diabetes, the danger grows, possibly leading to kidney failure, heart disease, blindness. That's the glucagon. You need it when you have like a seizure. I don't wanna lose my eyesight. I don't wanna have brain damage. I don't wanna die of early age. Like who does? Like that's the only thing that scares me. As soon as you change, you have to check your blood, now. But many scientists say that hope may be on the horizon. I do think we can cure it and our research has convinced me that that is going to be possible. Everything we learn says that it is possible. Doug Melton has spent the last seven years searching for a cure for diabetes. His work is personal. Both his children suffer from the disease. Today, he's optimistic about their future, thanks to a hot new field in medical research, which we've all heard about, Embryonic stem cells. These are cells that have the potential to become nerve cells, heart cells, blood cells, any kind of cell in the human body. Melton, now co-director of the new Harvard Stem Cell Institute, wants to turn them into insulin producing cells so they can help diabetics. So far, embryonic stem cells have been made mostly from frozen embryos left over from fertility treatment, and that on its own is controversial, but now there's a whole new way to make them that's drawing even more fire. It has to do with cloning. In February 2004, scientists in South Korea announced they had cloned human embryos and used them to create stem cells for research. I said, wow, they've done it. <laughs> Uh, I wish we had done it. Good, good. Dr. George Daly is a pediatrician who also studies stem cells. The fact that that barrier has now been passed, I think it really uh, motivates a lot of other scientists to, to say, we can do it too. Now, when most of us hear the word cloning, we think of the cloning of people, the stuff of science fiction films, both scary. They are totally obedient, taking any order without question. Dr. E. And absurd. He is exactly like you in every way. Call him Mini-Me. I don't know any credible scientist who wants to do that, who's working on that, and I think that we as a nation um, and as a world of community should outlaw that. There's really no reason to be doing that. I think it's important that it's clear that we're not cloning organisms, that we're cloning cells, that we're trying to create cells, not children. So if they're not making copies of people, what kind of cloning are the scientists talking about? Well, they say it would work like this. Start with an egg from a woman's ovary, remove its genes or DNA, then take a cell, like a skin cell, from a patient and put its DNA into the egg. This is called nuclear transfer. 
add a few chemicals, and the egg starts to divide, just like a fertilized egg. After a few days, it becomes a blastocyst, a ball of about 50 to 200 cells. If you wanted to clone a person, then you'd have to place the blastocyst in a woman's uterus. A similar process was used to create the famous sheep dolly. But these scientists don't want that. So instead, and this is the step that causes so much controversy, they would break down the outer layer of the blastocyst. It's at this point, there's no turning back. The blastocyst cannot develop into a child, but the remaining cells can become embryonic stem cells, ones with the exact same genetic makeup as the patient. The potential benefits are obvious to doctors like Leonard Zahn, who sees a lot of patients needing bone marrow transplants. For two-thirds of them, there's no donor with an acceptable genetic match. How are you feeling? Even if a donor is found, the match is never perfect. Zahn says with cloning, scientists could, in theory, grow cells customized to an individual patient. Thank you. you used embryonic stem cell technology. You might be able to generate embryonic stem cells that have the same immune system as the patient. You'd have less chance of rejection, and we would hope that there'd be less death rate associated with that. With cloning, this little boy, in theory, could get bone marrow cells that perfectly match his body. But there's much more to cloning than custom-made transplants. The thing that has scientists all over the world really excited is that cloning could allow them to do something completely new and different. Make sick cells. Now, why would they want to do that? Well, let's say you could take a cell from a patient, someone like Lauren. Create a clone. Let it grow in the lab until it's a blastocyst make stem cells. Then you could watch the cells as they get sick. That's exactly what Doug Melton wants to do. Just like Abbott and Costello said, who's on first? When you're watching these cells develop, one of them is going to make a mistake first. One of the genes in the disease cell line is going to screw up, and we want to be watching it every minute to say who's on first, who screwed up first. If we follow those cells in a culture dish, we can get at the root cause of the disease. If you could learn how Lauren's diabetes got started, you'd have a much better chance of curing it. This might work with lots of diseases that right now develop invisibly inside patients. Not just diabetes patients, but Parkinson's patients, Alzheimer's patients. That's why, instead of just studying healthy stem cells, scientists like Harvard's Kevin Egan want to use cloning to create stem cells that are genetically predisposed to a disease. Well, for certain diseases, it's true that cloning is the only way to do it. By taking cells from an individual which already has that disease, it does allow us to make embryonic stem cells that we know carry all the genes that are required for that disease. This is one of the frontiers. It's enormously exciting research. It's very valuable. It's, it's a whole fresh approach. Uses a holding Nobody can guarantee that this approach will lead to cures. And even if it does, tangible results could be 5, 10, 20 years down the road. But right now, it's unclear whether these scientists will even get started. This is the worst kind of science imaginable. The Catholic Church, along with many pro-life groups, has been a major opponent of cloning. Making human life simply to destroy it leads us right down directly on the road to barbarism. The eyes are 265. The U.S. The House of Representatives has voted twice to make all human cloning a crime. If the bill becomes law, anyone who defies the ban could go to jail for up to 10 years and face a million dollar fine. The measure is stalled in the Senate, but Senator Sam Brownback is trying to change that. The president's ready to sign a human cloning ban. We've been blocked in the Senate. With the last election, we're going to revive efforts to try to ban human cloning. 
President Bush supports some embryonic stem cell research, but only on a limited number of cell lines. He opposes cloning. We should not, as a society, grow life to destroy it. And that's exactly what's taking place. I personally believe that the nuclear transfer embryos that we create are, in a sense, not new life. I would argue that that embryo that's growing in a dish, just like many other in vitro fertilization embryos, doesn't actually have the potential to go on to become an individual unless it's transferred into the uterus of a woman who's willing to carry it to term. When does that human life significance begin? We know biologically it begins at conception. That's when your life began. That's when my life began. If I kill you as an embryo, you're not here today. If you kill me as an embryo and research on me, I'm not here. So we know that biologically. When does a human become a human with all the legal rights and protections of a person? Much of the debate comes down to this, a human blastocyst smaller than a grain of sand. Whether cloned or made from the union of egg and sperm, is it the same as a person? What are its rights? What is a human embryo? What is a human clone? Is it a person or is it a piece of property? And most Americans look at this and they say, life begins at conception. And if that's so, that life, there's a sacredness to it and we shouldn't be violating it. Oftentimes this issue is couched in terms of when does life begin. I think of it more of an issue of when does a person begin. And personhood for me is a process. The fertilized egg has the potential to become a person, but it won't necessarily become a person. Imagine you and I are sitting in an IVF clinic with my son and the fire alarm goes off. So now I have the choice of taking my son out of the room or grabbing a freezer with a hundred fertilized eggs. Which would I choose? I think for me that emphasizes the difference between a real life, a person who's a, who exists, and a potential. Both the blastocyst and the child are alive. Some scientists say we're approaching a crossroads where we, as a society, have to choose what life do we value more? Lauren's mom, Maura McCarthy Stanford, is a Catholic and the parent of a diabetic child. Hopeful that the work might lead to a cure for diabetes, she supports cloning for research. To me, that ball of cells is the miracle of possibility. It's the possibility of becoming a human being if it ends up implanted in a woman. It's the possibility of becoming cells to be put in my daughter because she needs to be cured of diabetes. It's the possibility of becoming the nerve endings for a spinal cord so someone can walk again. It hasn't made its mind up yet of what to be and therefore it is a possibility of all different kinds of life, whether it's new life or saving.